First of all, I'm Joan. I'm doing my postdoc in Barcelona. Um, I'm going to give a, like a very brief tour of, my, of a paper that we recently published. If you want to see more details, please go to there because, um, yeah, this is going to be very short. So the talk is going to be about persistent activity and activity silent. These mechanisms have been regarded as mutually exclusive. Um, and in this paper, we argue that they, in fact, they are uh, coexisting in prefrontal cortex and they underlie um, serial bias. But before I go there, let me give you a brief introduction of, about the field. So what are the neural mechanisms of working memory? So this now very classical experiment by Funahashi when he was in Goldman Rakish lab, they trained monkeys to perform this very simple working memory task where the monkeys had to uh, remember a location during a memory period. And when the monkeys were very good at this task, uh, they recorded from the frontal cortex. And here is one neuron um, from those recordings. So you can see that there are many trials of the neuron for many different stimuli location. And this neuron is mostly silent, except uh, for this location. Um, in particular, is active during the delay period. So during this uh, memory period where the monkey has to hold in memory uh, the location to afterwards make a saga. Um, so this, this finding is, not all neurons in the cortex have this behavior, of course, um, the very small fraction of them, but this finding is very replicable. So many people have found in particular in uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, this kind of neurons, and I'm going to focus in this talk about prefrontal cortex. So the question we have now is how, how do you simulate this persistent activity? I'm going to very uh, superficially introduce you to a model, bamba tracta model. And so here is one simulation of such model. Here you have all the neurons in that network. And here is the time during one simulation. And in this simulation, I'm, stimu I'm simulating that the monkey is memorizing 90 degrees. So I stimulate these neurons that code for 90 degrees. And because these neurons have a lot of recurrent connection, the recurrent connection is uh, strong, they are able to sustain during the whole delay period uh, this bump of activity. So this network, in a way, has a memory in this activity. So this neuron, for example, in the middle will have persistent activity as in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, as a side note, uh, we, in we include noise in these simulations, and so this bump can drift to different locations. And this drift is signature of this uh, uh, model. And this has been found in, uh, by other people in the lab. This drift has been found in prefrontal cortex, which is the area that I'm going to focus today. Now, Alternatively, there is this very nice paper by Mongil and Barak where um, they propose that instead of relying on the persistent activity, neurons could, um, could have memory, uh, short-term memory, by instead changing very quickly their, their synaptic strength or their effective uh, connectivity. I'm not going into details again, just bear in mind that um, the neurons might be silent but still having memory in their synapses. Okay. Instead, I'm going to focus on what are the predictions when you mix these two mechanisms, activity silent and this bump attractor. In particular, I'm going to focus on the last two, uh, but I'll leave the other slides for, for the record. Uh, so here in this um, simulation here is the same as before, but now I included this short-term facilitation, much like Bonjil and Barak, and the network is still able to have memory during the delay period. But if I reduce the background input that all these neurons receive, now the network as, is not by stable anymore. So you cannot have any memory during the delay period, okay? But because I have these mechanisms operating in their synapses, these neurons that were active during the, the stimulus presentation, they will, they will be a bit more strongly connected. And so I can reactivate the previous representation. So in this period, I'm stimulating all the neurons in the network and I can reactivate the previous representation as you can see by these turning curves. So, um, up until today, okay, so this is a neural signature of this activity sound mechanisms. And, um, and this, up until today, this is the, the this, in this very nice paper, it's the only uh, evidence for these reactivations and it's in uh, EEG. Not going into the detail, I invite you to read the paper, but uh, today I'm going to show you evidence also for uh, single unit activity for this reactivation. Another prediction of this uh, interplay between these two mechanisms is the sequential effect. Uh, so here I'm showing you two trials. So it's a simulation of one trial at this location and another trial of that location. And you can see that the current trial, this will be the previous trial, the current trial is slightly attracted towards the previous trial. And this effect is very small, but if you 
plot on the x-axis the distance between the current and the previous stimulus, and on the y-axis you plot this error, you can see that this effect is um, um, it's uh, weak, so it's two degrees, but it's very systematic and decreases with the uh, distances. So as you put the current stimulus further and further away, this interference fades away. So this would be a behavioral signature of this uh, interplay between short-term plasticity and bumper drag. And many people before us have shown that. Um, and of course, this also happens in nature. So we, we have shown that for color, but many people before us shown that, that it's actually a very uh, prominent uh, effect in probably all working memory tasks for things like phrase attractiveness or uh, body estimation, stuff like that. Okay. So the hypothesis that I'm going to pursue for the rest of the talk is, is this uh, sequential effect um, actually a product of this interaction between persistent activity and activity silent? And in particular, do we see these um, reactivations that I, that I told you about? Uh, I don't have much time to go into the details, but we are going to focus on single units from uh, monkey PFC and uh, EEG from uh, humans. And both species will be performing a very similar task. So it's the same task I introduced in the beginning. But in particular, we're going to focus on consecutive trials. And of course, during this, uh, what happens in between these trials. So when the information about the previous trial uh, continues until the current trial and interferes. Okay, so let's start with monkey data. So here I'm showing you uh, a decoding accuracy. So I'm trying to, to decode what was the stimulus location on the previous trial? And you see that during the previous delay, this decoding accuracy is maximum, as you would expect by this uh, persistently active neurons. Even by eyeballing, you could decode it, as I showed in that picture. Um, and you have that in a single unit activity. So this is population decoder, and this is just a single unit turning curves. But interestingly, during the ITI, this information disappears from the spikes. So you cannot see that, that the tuning curve is now flat. This neuron has no selective persistent activity anymore. But there is this reactivation, so at right before the next stimulus, which would come here, there is this reappearance of the previous stimulus code. Okay, so this will be evidence for these reactivations in uh, PFC. And um, we have a similar, however, with some uh, details I'm going to skip, we have a similar effect in humans. So this is the EEG uh, decoder. You can see also reactivations prior to the next stimulus. Now, how to, stim how to simulate these this findings that we had? Um, so here I'm showing you again two consecutive trials. And um, during the ITI, I removed the bump. So you see that the, a decoder, which is depicted here in black, cannot decode uh, the previous stimulus. But if I give us an input to all the neurons in the network right before the, the next stimulus, then again, you can recover the previous tuning, weaker, but still it's still there. And you can, uh, using population decoder, you can decode the previous stimulus. Just for comparison, this is much like what we found in neurophysiology. Okay, so we're able to simulate these findings. And now, of course, we want to push the model further and try to uh, predict stuff that we didn't know. So we have a few predictions in the paper. I'm going to introduce you to three of them that I think are the most cool ones. So the first is that reactivation should lead to stronger sequential effects. So here in this model, um, if I run many of these simulations and now I compute the, the, the behavior from this model, you can see here that when I have um, uh, reactivations at this point, the serial bias are much stronger than when I don't have. Okay, so this is the model. And so I went to the data and tried to find evidence for that. In particular, we went for this period where we had um, uh, reactivations. And we, we, we use a leave one out decoder to assess the previous stimulus information on a trial by trial basis. And then we separate the trials on trials where you have a high decoding accuracy, which would correspond to reactivation trials, from trials where you had no or lower uh, uh, previous stimulus accuracy, which would correspond to uh, no reactivations. And indeed, we found that uh, we have a much stronger serial bias for trials with a high decoding accuracy. In fact, with, with no reactivations, we had this. Uh, repulsion, which I'm happy to discuss later on. And if we repeat the same analysis in a, in a silent period, then this doesn't occur because we have no reactivations there. And uh, similar uh, stuff happens uh, with humans. I have to skip the details, fortunately. Um, now, the second prediction is to test the PFC involvement in humans because in monkeys, we were recording from PFC. So, of course, 
there's already this link between the, what the neurons were doing and what the monkey did on each trial. But in humans, we are recording from EEG. And as you probably know, uh, when you try to decode memory contents, working memory contents from EEG, you are mostly uh, decoding from occipital cortex. Uh, but some people, like, like myself, believe that this might be because of top-down connections from PFC. And so we wanted to, uh, to test this. So what we did is the similar task. But now instead of, so with an extra set of 20 subjects, but now instead of EG, we had TMS delivered at the, the reactivation period, so at, in the, during the fixation. And we had two controls. We had one, on some trials, we didn't deliver anything. On other trials, we delivered TMS. And uh, we target TMS at PFC, selected from this meta study from the neurosync. And on other, on other sessions, we targeted vertex. So that we, what we expect is that in vertex, nothing happens. Um, and the prediction is, again, that if you have reactivations, you should have more stronger serial bias. And this is, in fact, what we found. So if I plot the distance between these two curves, you see that for PFC, we, there is indeed an increase of the serial bias, while for vertex, these two curves are not different. Again, a lot of details I'm keeping here for the sake of time. Happy to, to go back to it. Otherwise, please refer to our paper. Now, finally, uh, all the evidence for activity silent that are in the literature are mostly uh, negative findings. So it's like you can't decode something and then suddenly you can. So if, if it's not in the spikes, it has to be somewhere. Why not in the, um, in the synapses? We wanted to be a bit more ambitious and try to find some positive evidence for these uh, silent traces. And we took inspiration from this paper. This is a th theoretical paper, which uh, shows that if you have stronger coupling between pairs of neurons, this should be reflected in stronger correlation. So we tested this in the model first. And so during this period where you have no fine rates of activity, which is key to do not confound this analysis, um, we separated trials where pairs of neurons were engaged in a bump, so engaged in a memory trial, for trials that these neurons were not engaged in a bump. Okay? So, and what we expect is, as from that paper, is that you, even though you have no selectivity in the fine rate, there's still selectivity in the cross correlograms. Okay? Um, so we went to PFC, and here is one pair, which shows the same. And when we look at all the population, so this is just 27 neurons, because these are all the neurons that had similar uh, preferred uh, location. Okay? And so we see the population does a similar thing, as expected. So here, um, as expected by the simulations. So here, what we are plotting on the y-axis is this peak, and on the x-axis is the peak of the, of the black line. Okay? So as by, expected by the simulations, you see an increase of connectivity, as we'd expect by this uh, silent trace operating in the synapses. Um, okay, I think I will, yeah, so I don't know how, how well I'm in time, but so here's a summary. Uh, basically, we find evidence for these reactivations, and there is a few uh, predictions that we uh, tested. There are more in the paper, uh, um, and I'm happy to take uh, questions, but before I have to acknowledge Neuromax to give me this great opportunity and, um, and all the people who did uh, the work. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge Albert, who is my PI. This is his pool. He's, uh, I can't um, recommend enough. If you are looking for a job at some point in your career, you should contact him. He has this rare combination of being humble and very smart. So yeah, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions if you have some. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, all right, we'll open it up for questions. Um, so uh, people should feel free to use the chat. Um, also, if you either send me a chat message or raise your hand, I can unmute you. All right. Oh, we have one here. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Jenny Boss from uh, from Marseille. Uh, great talks and very nice conference. Very cool to have this uh, right now. I have a question about. Uh, about the, the, the Brunel and Wang paper from uh, Sorry, I didn't hear you. About so what? can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. I didn't get what was the question about. Sorry. So uh, it's about, about uh, the paper from Brunel, Brunel and, and Wang about uh, persistent activity, BFC. So in my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, because it's not my, 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 my field, uh, to erase the sustained activities, they have a large pattern of uh, stimulation that will stimulate all the population in the neurons. And, and reset all the synaptic weights. Um, and and uh, so I'm just questioning whether, whether this is uh, pertinent in your, in your model 
and uh, if you can comment on that and whether it's it will not yes. also erase your your uh, your synaptic rate and your yes. memory your trace of memory in this case yeah that's a great question C can you see my slides yes okay so yeah you 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 really spot uh, like a limitation of this idea so actually what i'm doing here is i give a negative input i, I don't give a uh, um, uh, like a positive input like in brunel's or albert's actually paper yeah. so i mean if i give a negative input then the synapses remain um, uh, facilitated it's expected that if i give a strong input in fact we we, we have we talk about that in the paper and we have some uh, experiments about that. If we give a very strong input here, you, you basically remove all the tuning from the synapses. Um, but I don't know if there is a range where you can stimulate uh, positively instead of negatively and still remove the bump, but not the trace in the synapses. So, but, okay. yeah. Am I still on? Excuse me? Am I still on? Yeah. So what, what does it mean? Like physiologically is that a negative input in terms of uh, Neural activity. It could be, yeah. I mean, what does it mean? A, a positive input, right? So it's it's just an uh, inhibitory input. Um, I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, you can feel free to ask in uh, by a chat or a hand raise. One has a question. Uh, yeah, I'll do Brad next. Hey, really nice talk. Hi, Brad. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about the if you've I've, I've discussed this with Albert a little bit offline, but I'm wondering if you've thought about the role of control. So, um, in some of our data, for example, whether or not the TMS pulse produces a reactivation is a function of whether the information is still in working memory or not. And it seems as though what you're describing is, um, and, and this kind of follows, I think, from the earlier question as well, that, that there are passive properties of, of synaptic weights that will maybe respond differently as a function of the intensity of the input or something like that. But have you thought about a way that the system could be controlled such that you could either, um, as we say, shake the etch a sketch, you know, and erase, wipe clean the the information that's encoded in the weights when that's important, or alternatively, preserve it uh, if it might be relevant behaviorally later on. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's indeed relevant uh, related to the previous question. So if you if you give a very strong uh, impulse here, you will basically facilitate all um, synapses. So you lose the tuning. So there's no way you can recover it, even, either by reactivating or just uh, being uh, biased on that second trial. Um, if you instead give an uh, inhibitory input, then you can remove the bump and still have um, this information in the synapses. Now, I don't know what happens if you play with this stimulation and maybe there is yeah, there, there, there's, there's some work to be done here to play with, the, stimula with this, uh, the strength of the stimulation. We did some of it in the paper with the TMS experiment. This is all we know. Hi, can everybody hear me? I can see you. I yeah. can hear you now. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, I have a question. So if my understanding is correct, you're trying to say that the serial dependence or serial bias is due to some uh, reactivation before the next trial. Uh, so where does this reactivation come from? It's because the subjects are trying to predict the next trial, which means if we jitter the inter-trial interval in a very randomly way, then we could not find this reactivation. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm trying. Yeah, so first of all, uh, that, that's a great question. And first of all, uh, you don't need reactivation to have serial bias. If you have reactivations, you should have stronger serial bias. So as I, try, uh, yeah, I don't have a slide here, but 
So here in these simulations, you see my slides, no, I hope? Yes. So here there's no reactivation and you still have zero bias because, uh, because the synapses here are slightly enhanced, then this bump would drift towards it. If you have reactivation, then the attraction is stronger. It's one part of the question. Um, the second part of the question is, why do these reactivation happen? Uh, in, in the main experiment of the paper, uh, the, the intertrial was predictable. And so as you, as you are um, suggesting, it could be the reason why they have these reactivations. And in fact, in another data set, um, in collaboration with Kirsten Adam, and uh, this, this is not, we didn't collect this data, but they had, um, the intertrials were um, random. So you could not predict when the next trial would come. And then you, you didn't have any reactivation. Okay? Mm. Um, but you do have zero bias. As, oh, as, uh, I see. But yeah, the, the, the best experiment would be to have blocks for the same subjects, blocks of trials where the, you, could, you can predict and blocks of trials that you can predict. Um, this is a complete, another experiment, another set of subjects. So it's not the best experiment, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you for my question. Great. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna uh, switch over to our third speaker. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Um,